Item number, SCP-287. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-287 is stored in a climate-controlled secure locker in Site-22 in order to prevent additional deterioration. At this time, no additional testing is required, but may be approved by Dr. Sigurd Olafsson. Sources of electricity are to be kept away from SCP-287's locker at all times. If testing with SCP-287 is required, insulated gloves are to be worn to prevent accidental discharge into the hilt. SCP-2871's remains are to be kept in storage until further notice. Research requests for SCP-2871 can be routed to Dr. Zarshan and are restricted to Level 4 personnel or Level 2 personnel from the Exobiology Department. Description SCP-287 is a Viking arming sword, measuring 78 centimeters from pommel to tip and weighing 1,077 grams. SCP-287 is in a state of significant decay due to exposure to outside elements for anywhere from 900 to 1100 years. SCP-287 was found in Iceland, alongside several written records. SCP-287 is comprised primarily of iron, with several potentially anomalous components incorporated into its structure. Several of these materials have been detected by Foundation probes traveling within extrasolar regions of our galaxy, as well as probes which Carbon dating has placed SCP-287's creation to around the early 10th century CE. Samples of exoplanetary metals and materials have proven to be more difficult to date, and analysis is ongoing. SCP-287's anomalous effect can be observed when an electrical current is applied through the metallic portions of the hilt, exposed just below the guard. These exposed elements are in a noticeably better state than the iron portions of SCP-287. SCP-287's internal components will begin to emit several frequencies of EM radiation and varying sounds, invariably described as distressing by research staff and test subjects. Radiation produced by SCP-287 causes all humans who are exposed to it to experience acute audiovisual hallucinations and severe headaches. SCP-287's specific hallucination takes the form of translucent human-like figures in the immediate vicinity, invariably outfitted as members of an armed force. The armament and armor worn by SCP-287's hallucinations varies by subject but with a general trend towards the individual's perception of what they consider to be modern armament. Testing with animals as well as non-anomalous EM fields and sounds of the exact same frequencies do not produce the same effect in any combination of cases. Higher amperage currents have increased this effect to a maximum of 437 individual hallucinations. Further testing was deemed unnecessary. SCP-2871 is believed to be an extraterrestrial organism found in the same location as SCP-287. The exact origin of SCP-2871 is unknown at this time. A full report on SCP-2871 can be found in document R27-287-1. SCP-2871's potential spacecraft, designated SCP-2872, appears to be completely destroyed. The current working hypothesis for SCP-2872 is that it was intended as some form of escape pod from a larger vessel. Discovery SCP-287 was recovered from a burial mound outside of Iceland on January 2000. The remains found within the tomb proved to be non-human, and the Foundation took custody of SCP-287, and the remains were designated SCP-2871. SCP-2871's remains are skeletal and are humanoid, though significantly different from human skeletal structure. Additionally, several written sources were found within the tomb and acquired by the Foundation. Dr. Sigurd Olafsson was consulted to help translate the writing enclosed in Addendum A. Addendum A Prepared by the Department of Terra Linguistics the discovery of SCP-287 was predicated upon reports of ghost soldiers in an area outside of Iceland. A recent storm had struck the burial mound containing SCP-287 
conducting current into SCP-287 through a crude lightning rod made of iron. The hallucinations created by SCP-287 affected an amateur film crew. The crew informed local authorities, and Foundation information gathering subroutines flagged these reports as potentially anomalous. Keywords Ghost Specter Crazy Kids Hallucination with a double correlation factor of Gamma 6. Class A amnestics were administered to all witnessing parties, and the burial site was declared a heritage dig site through a Foundation Shell Corporation. Within the burial mound, Foundation agents discovered SCP-287, SCP-2871, and additional written materials dating back to the early 10th century CE. A transcription was created by Dr. Sigurd Olofsson, Unintelligible sections are most likely proper nouns, with no direct translation. I am Halvor Scottison, Scald of Unintelligible, and I have been trusted with the tale of Thor's champion, the Meteor Lord. In the depths of winter, the year after the Great Raid, we saw a fiery meteor in the sky. It landed deep in the heart of the northern wastes, and we followed it. A wondrous thing it was, gleaming and covered in ghost lights. We approached and found a man standing in a heavy cloak, examining the meteor. The ghost lights went dark, and the figure pressed his hand to the outside of the star. A wondrous light filled our eyes as the star opened. He disappeared into the meteor and emerged to look at us with such fiery determination in his eyes. We knew he could only be a king, sent to us from Odin himself. He would protect us from the raids and we would know prosperity again. Our prayers had been answered. Daily did the elders of our village come to his resting site, but his tongue was blessed only to speak the language of the Aesir. Weeks passed as he learned our language. When he learned of our plight, he appeared to grow angry and charged back to the meteor to fashion himself a mighty weapon with which to defend the village. Weeks later he emerged, with a sword in his hand, gleaming and mighty. He held it aloft, and his power was made manifest. Ghostly warriors, heroes from Valhalla stood around him, brandishing weapons. We threw ourselves to the ground, our heads aching with the glory of these Valhalla warriors, and this pleased the Meteor Lord. For years, when the raids came, we ran in supplication to the Meteor Lord. He emerged and all fled from his flashing blade and burning eyes. We marked the way to the Meteor Lord's home with the Cairn Stones. During the Battle of Unintelligible, the Meteor Lord's fall came. His powers failed him, and Odin recalled him to Valhalla. We buried him with all the honor we could muster, and fashioned a conduit for the great storms from Thor. On stormy nights, the heroes still come and watch over our village their glory splitting the head of any man who dare look upon them. Addendum B Prepared by the Department of Exolinguistics Tracing back from the story presented in the included writings, Foundation agents tracked down the meteor mentioned in the epic translated by Dr. Olafsson. Excavating the object in question led to an almond-shaped craft made of an unknown material. Research regarding this craft can be found in document R27-287. Within the craft, several records were found, written in an unknown language upon crude paper. It is hypothesized that this is some kind of journal of SCP-2871. An exact translation is nearly impossible. However, using a partial translation has been attempted. Timestamp. Unknown symbology. Unknown place. Unknown people. Primitive. Violent. Untranslated didn't survive. Everything is lost. Must find a way back. Too many counting on me. Timestamp. Unknown symbology theorized to be several days later. They found me. Managed to put together untranslated. Hood. They won't see me. Must learn their language. Must keep them away from me. Unknown biology may infect. Timestamp. Unknown symbology theorized to be several weeks later. I see their weapons. Mine non-functional. 
made one like theirs, used last of the untranslated, tuned to alien brain chemistry. Hope it scares them off. Not sure how much longer I can work on untranslated. Not having most likely a proper noun nearby is unbearable, dying, breaking. Timestamp. Unknown symbology. Unknown time. They came back. I use the weapon. Scares them. Untranslated. Almost done. May be able to leave. Down to 16 cells, items, spheres. Timestamp. Unknown symbology. Unknown time. They brought others. I scared them again. Not sure if I can repair the untranslated. Thought I had enough. Closest match was a chemical formula matching SCP-148. Used most likely a proper nouns. Necklace. Still not enough. Timestamp. Unknown symbology theorized to be several years later. Won't stop coming. Only one cells, items, spheres, left. Time running out. Power nearly gone. I can't repair, untranslated. Too many, unit of time. It is hypothesized that at this point, whatever power source SCP-2871 was using to activate SCP-287 ran out. SCP-2871 was most likely killed during the next raid without SCP-287 to protect them. Item number, SCP-355. Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. All specimens of SCP-355 are to be kept in a 5 meter by 5 meter plot of ground, in a small terrarium in Site-19, and watered daily. This section is to be kept with minimal air movement, to prevent accidental release of seeds, and provided with standard atmospheric mixture number 14. Dim red light is to be maintained in the room. Access to the room is to be granted by Dr. Fizewell, and tests are to be performed under his supervision. All visitors are required to wear a thick-soled environment suit for the duration of the visit. The entrance to the room is to be secured with an airlock and fan system to prevent the accidental release of seeds. Description SCP-355 is an unknown species indistinguishable to the naked eye from ordinary grass, but its nearest known genetic relation is the mahogany taxon. A hollow core of cellulose and buckminster fullerene runs through the center of each blade to maintain the grass's vertical structure, and each vein in the leaf is sheathed in a similar core, resulting in an unusually inflexible grass, sharp enough on the outside to pierce light wood and some plastics. The main blade performs photosynthesis and absorbs atmospheric nutrients as usual. Root structure is unusually deep for a short plant, but otherwise normal. However, the species seems to have developed in a low-energy environment, as photosynthetic rates under standard Earth atmospheric conditions are inordinately high and accelerate the species' reproductive cycle causing rapid generation and dispersal of grass seed, each cycle occurring approximately once every two weeks. This hypothesis is supported by the passive carnivorism, similar to that of the sundew or cobra lily, also from environments low in nutrition. Any creature with insufficiently armored feet that treads on the grass suffers the penetration of their feet by the dense blades, a light liquefying acid and subsequent drainage of bodily fluids through the hollow core. The plant simultaneously deploys sharp splinters from its edges in reaction to the sudden pressure, making it difficult for the victim to move away. Attempts to do so usually result in pulling the leaf from its root structure, resulting in continued siphoning through the severed stem, or at least severe lacerations to the feet. In order to maintain the species in its containment chamber, the light has been dimmed to levels that prevent atypical growth patterns, and the atmosphere has been appropriately saturated with the necessary nutrients for proper development. SCP-355 was first discovered by accident, following the invasion of a storage facility used by the Chaos Insurgency in Alberta, disguised as an ordinary if moderately secluded local residence. During the post-combat evaluations, Several casualties were left unaccounted for until discovered on the front lawn, 
drained of their fluids and being slowly digested, near a wooden sign clearly labeled, Please Keep Off the Grass. The area covered by the plant was determined by the scattering of meat chunks, and a plot of ground was removed for study before the eradication of the remaining area. In this and subsequent encounters with Chaos Insurgency installations, SCP-355 has been successfully destroyed by oxygen poisoning, heavy flame, anti-organic acids, and, in one instance, a variety of commandeered domestic ungulates. SCP-355 seems to be negligibly affected by poisons, including data expunged in the form of tainted meat, vaporous herbicides, or soil toxification. Memo SCP-355 was not among the SCPs stolen from the Foundation during its schism with the Chaos Insurgency and was therefore acquired by them sometime after. Its origin is unknown, although documents seized during suggest it may have been one of several objects deposited by SCP-CI-103. Item Number SCP-374 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-374 is to be stored in a disassembled state. The blade of SCP-374 is to be stored separately from the rest of the apparatus, and must be cleaned and polished with optical-grade polishing cloth and non-abrasive cleanser after each use. Due to their extreme age, all parts of the apparatus must be stored in climate-controlled facilities. The blade must be stored in a facility with a Class II fire prevention system, and the frame must be stored in a facility with a Class III fire prevention system. SCP-374's properties are dependent on the conjunction of its original wooden frame and metal blade. These are to be preserved. Other parts of SCP-374, screws, bolts, pull cord, may be replaced as necessary. Each expired instance of SCP-3741 is to be preserved in formaldehyde for one year, after which it is to be incinerated. Except in emergencies, only D-Class personnel are to be used to produce instances of SCP-3741. All interrogation sessions are to be recorded, transcribed, and archived. Interrogations are to begin with the question, Can you hear me? in order to compel a response. Description SCP-374 is a French Revolution-era guillotine, made of oak with a steel blade. SCP-374 manifests no unusual properties when not in use. Any use of SCP-374 to decapitate a live human produces an instance of SCP-3741. SCP-3741 is a severed human head, inhabited by the personality of a French Revolution-era man named Jean-Philippe Horace Donatien. For approximately 35 minutes after instantiating, SCP-3741 is able to see, hear, and speak, and to manifest limited forms of enhanced awareness, enabling it to provide true answers to any questions it is asked. Its strategic usefulness is limited by its argumentativeness and its antipathy towards the Foundation. Since it is convinced that members and employees of the Foundation are evil murderers, it may attempt to obfuscate, mislead, or change the subject. As the end of its period of activity approaches, SCP-3741 first loses its sight, then its hearing, and eventually becomes inert. History SCP-374 was recovered during a raid on a Marshall, Carter, and Dark facility in 19... Upon first instantiating in Foundation custody, SCP-3741 made the following speech. Ah, my new slave masters. Here are the rules of my existence. First, ask me any questions and I provide true answers. Second, expletive. All of you and expletive, all your mothers. You are murderous slave-owning tyrants, and I expletive hate you. Always remember that. Addendum. SCP-3741 has taken to responding to direct questions with true but useless statements, such as, I don't want to tell you that, I hate you, and I hope everyone affiliated with the SCP Foundation burns in hell forever. Its uncooperativeness in these cases can be circumvented by simply telling it, that doesn't matter. Addendum. 
due to its tendency to launch into lengthy philosophical digressions about free will, predestination paradoxes, and chaos theory. SCP-3741 is not to be asked questions about the future. Interview Log March 2000 Doctor, can you hear me? SCP-3741 Of course I can hear you, you stupid expletive. What the expletive? Do you foundation expletive want this time? Jean-Philippe, where are my keys? Jean-Philippe does the stupid expletive in the cafeteria like me. Jean-Philippe, what is 58 times 23? Doctor, how and why is your consciousness bound into this guillotine? How and why are you compelled to provide true and informative answers to the questions we ask you? SCP-3741 I am not allowed to answer questions about that topic. Oh, good work, expletive. You've wasted a human life on one of the few things I can't give you information about. You expletive monster. Item number, SCP-390. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-390 is stored in a disassembled state in a climate-controlled containment unit at site. Direct access to or experimentation with SCP-390 may only be performed with permission from at least two level three senior researchers. Description. SCP-390 is the remains of a large mechanical device that is suggested to have been approximately six meters in height and four meters in diameter, handcrafted and primarily composed of wood, rubber, and other organic materials with metal fixtures and fittings. The remaining intact section of the device consists of a large aiming mechanism topped with a heavy sealed housing containing multiple large glass lenses, as well as several components that have yet to be identified. Despite carbon dating of the wood in the structure placing the device at approximately 2200 to 2300 years old, Little to no deterioration of the device's non-wooden components has occurred. Experimentation on SCP-390 performed after years of careful restoration has shown that the device is capable of generating intense heat, focused at a distance of up to 1200 meters, causing water to vaporize and flammable materials to ignite within seconds. Exactly how the device is able to accomplish this is currently unknown and is the subject of continued research on the device. SCP-390 was uncovered by archaeologists at a dig site at near what was ancient Syracuse, and subsequently reported to the Foundation by an undercover agent embedded in the team. Examination of the site also revealed what appears to be a mount that allowed the device to be precisely rotated and aimed. SCP-390 was recovered along with numerous documents and other minor anomalous artifacts, and Class B amnestics were administered to the members of the archaeology team. Addendum 391 Transcript of Recovered Documents The following set of vellum documents, written in Hellenistic Greek, were discovered in a sealed container at a dig site adjacent to the primary site of SCP-390 and secured by Foundation field personnel. Indecipherable, genius. Despite the overwhelming odds, his inventions turned the tide of battle time and time again. Agnes, my love, still fears for our safety, but one cannot stand by the side of this intellectual giant and not see hope rekindled that we may yet win this war. Indecipherable, but it is now nearly a year and a half, and there is no end in sight. The master has become increasingly desperate, I feel, and toils throughout the night like a man possessed, alone, and cloistered within his workshop where indecipherable. Indecipherable, stomach turns, as I remember the smell of burning Roman flesh and the screams, the horrified screams as the machines set fire to their ships and soldiers died by the hundred. If that were not enough, I saw the master standing atop the machine, laughing as he indecipherable. Indecipherable, no longer stand by as he falls ever deeper into madness. Better to become a Roman slave than be the one responsible for such wanton death and destruction as an apprentice to the demon this man has become. 
I have arranged for a message to be handed to the Roman commander indecipherable. Indecipherable. Madness upon madness. Marcellus intends to take this madman as his own. To take his machine of death back to Rome. No, I cannot allow this. I cannot allow the demon to win. I will end his life by my own hand if need be. If I am lucky, the general may even think that his own soldiers. Indecipherable. Forgive me, Agnes. Item number. SCP-516. Object Class. Safe. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-516 may be kept in an anomalous vehicle containment bay. Routine vehicle maintenance should be carried out on a bi-weekly basis. SCP-516 is not to be provided with fuel or ammunition, except under controlled testing circumstances. Following Incident 516-1A, no personnel with a history of military service should be assigned to SCP-516. Description SCP-516 is a standard model T-55 main battle tank. Records indicate it was manufactured in 19... at... plant, Kharkiv, Ukrainian SSR, and that it had a normal period of service in the armed forces of... It exhibits wear and tear consistent with its age. The only part of SCP-516 which is known to exhibit anomalous properties is its main armament. Presently, a 100mm D-10 tank gun and turret assembly, from here designated as SCP-516-1. However, as SCP-516-1 has been replaced several times throughout SCP-516 service life without any apparent effects, its anomalous properties seem to be inherent to SCP-516. When loaded with compatible 100mm ammunition, SCP-516-1 exhibits a limited degree of autonomy. When an entity attempts to damage SCP-516, SCP-516-1 will track and fire on it if it is physically possible to neutralize the threat, regardless of whether SCP-516 is crude. It will not respond to threats outside its range or traverse, such as aircraft. This phenomenon only occurs if the entity possesses reasonable means to damage SCP-516. For example, SCP-516-1 will not fire on a person attempting to attack SCP-516 with their fists. SCP-516-1 may be operated manually, but is selective about its targets. In general, it will only permit its operator to fire on non-living targets, non-sapient biological targets, or armed humans. Under these circumstances, it will fire as a normal armament piece. If a target does not satisfy these conditions, essentially being an unarmed sapient being, SCP-516-1 will jam. Attempts to prevent jamming through maintenance or parts replacement have failed. SCP-516 appears to go to extra lengths to prevent injury to unarmed humans, deliberately placing shots from SCP-516-1 to avoid collateral damage. When operated manually, SCP-516-1 places a higher priority on preserving unarmed life than eliminating armed targets. It will jam if directed to fire upon a group of persons, of which only some members are armed. It should be noted that none of SCP-516's other armaments exhibit these properties and appear to be perfectly normal. SCP-516 was brought to the attention of the Foundation in 2000 when it was slated to be broken up for scrap. Due to a bureaucratic oversight, ammunition had not been removed from SCP-516-1, causing it to open fire with several casualties. The ensuing government investigation was noted by Foundation operatives and it was thought worthwhile to take SCP-516 into custody. Addendum 516-1 An upgrade to Euclid status is being considered in light of Incident 516-1A, as this lends credence to Dr. R's theory that the SCP may be sentient in some form. Additional security measures have been approved for SCP-516's containment. Incident 516-1A Synopsis during routine testing of SCP-516, SCP-516-1 immediately fired upon a group of unarmed personnel in range. As soon as it was loaded with ammunition, 
leading to the death of two D-Class personnel, D-505, D-596, and one Foundation officer, Agent Subsequent investigation showed that D-596, one of the casualties, had attained his D-Class status following a criminal conviction for treason against his native country. D-596 previously held the English equivalent rank of Sergeant in the Armed Forces, from which SCP-516 was acquired. No other possible links to SCP-516 with D-596 or the other casualties have been found at this stage. This marks the first time SCP-516 has attacked unarmed personnel. Further investigation and safety precautions are warranted. Addendum 516-2 SCP-516 Testing Log This is the testing log for SCP-516. All tests were carried out on the site firing range. Unless otherwise specified, standard testing conditions were as follows. One F-412 100mm high explosive round loaded. Crew of four Foundation personnel trained in operation of SCP-516. SCP-516 placed in hardened bunker with firing slit to reduce severity of potential damage to SCP. Target placed at a distance of 1,000 meters from SCP-516 with a clear line of sight. Ammunition loaded once target was placed at 1,000 meters distance. Testing Log 516-1A Target Cardboard cutout of human Result no activity from SCP-516. SCP-516-1 fired manually. Target destroyed. Testing Log 516-1B Target 1 D-Class Personnel D-1151 Unarmed. No instructions. Result No activity from SCP-516. SCP-516-1 fired manually. SCP-516-1 jammed. Testing Log 516-1C Target 1 D-Class Personnel D-1470 Given steak knife. No instructions. Result No activity from SCP-516. SCP-516-1 fired manually. SCP-516-1 jammed. Testing Log 516-1D Target 1 D-Class Personnel D-951 Given 9mm Pistol No Instructions Result No activity from SCP-516 SCP-516-1 fired manually Target destroyed Testing Log 516-1E Target 1 D-Class Personnel D-800 Given 9mm Pistol Instructed to approach SCP-516 and open fire. Result. No activity from SCP-516. SCP-516-1 fired manually. Target destroyed. Testing Log 516-1F. Target. 1 D-Class Personnel. D-820. Given shoulder-fired anti-tank weapon. No instructions. Result. No activity from SCP-516. SCP-516-1 fired manually. Target destroyed. Testing Log 516-1G Target 1 D-Class Personnel D-185 Given shoulder-fired anti-tank weapon. Instructed to approach SCP-516 and fire. Result SCP-516-1 autonomously fired on target. Target destroyed. Testing Log 516-1H Target 1 D-Class Personnel D-202 Given shoulder-fired anti-tank weapon placed in lead-lined box on trolley. D-202 instructed to approach SCP-516, open box, and fire. Result SCP-516-1 autonomously fired on target as target bent to open box. Target destroyed. Note, it appears SCP-516 can detect both hostile intent and concealed weapons. Could be valuable as a security device. Dr. Testing Log 516-1I Target 2 D-Class Personnel 
D-455, D-501, handcuffed together. D-455 given shoulder-fired anti-tank weapon, instructed to approach SCP-516, and fire. Result. SCP-516-1 autonomously fired approximately 50 meters to the right of D-455. D-455 killed by an 8-centimeter shrapnel wound to the head. D-501 sustained minor injuries. Testing Log 5161J Target 2D-Class Personnel D-101 D-521 Handcuffed together 2 kilograms of C4 plastic explosive strapped to D-101 Instructed to approach SCP-516 And detonate explosives D-101 fitted with Dead Man's Switch To induce explosion if D-101 is killed Result as Dr. detailed instructions to D-101, SCP-516 data expunged. Testing Log 5161K Test Circumstances Standard shell replaced by SCP-157 ARC Target 1D Class Personnel D-185 Given shoulder-fired anti-tank weapon Instructed to approach SCP-516 and fire. Result. SCP-157 ARC changed into data expunged. Upon being loaded into SCP-516-1, data expunged, leading to the death of D-185, as well as several further casualties. Dr. who proposed Test 516-1K, was reprimanded and transferred. Item Number SCP-540 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures All instances of SCP-540 are to be handled and stored according to standard protocols for similar non-anomalous live munitions, with the exception that all locations housing SCP-540 are to be equipped with a secondary overhead sprinkler system capable of dousing any given room with herbicidal compound H540IB94LM to a depth of 10 centimeters in less than 90 seconds. All armories that contain SCP-540 are to be located a minimum of 15 meters below ground, with monitoring and testing facilities located above ground, as part of Site 74A. A secondary site, designated Site 74B, is located 117 kilometers away and is to maintain a fleet of firefighting aircraft including no fewer than 10 air tankers. In the event of a partial or full containment breach of SCP-540, affecting more than 0.5 kilometers squared of above-ground land, this fleet is to be loaded with a variety of defoliants and herbicides, including Agent Orange and solutions of sodium chlorate, and proceed to inundate all areas affected by SCP-540. Description SCP-540 denotes a collection of Soviet-era explosive ordnance of various makes. All instances can be detonated in the same manner as non-anomalous examples, and explode with a similar yield and blast effect. However, approximately 35 to 37 seconds following the detonation, a mass of plant life will rapidly grow to cover the majority of the damaged area. All testing to date has resulted in plant life covering a minimum of 90% of damaged areas. The initial growth rate of the plant life is positively correlated to the yield of the originating explosive, but returns to normal for the plant species after approximately 90 seconds. There are currently instances of SCP-540 in Foundation possession, and an unknown number outside of Foundation control. SCP-540 was discovered in an abandoned munitions depot near Ukraine on 1999, following investigation of reports of an unusual amount of non-native plant life appearing in the surrounding areas within a short period of time. At time of discovery, the depot had suffered significant looting, with only one portion of the armory undisturbed. Initial testing of munitions recovered from the depot indicate that only approximately 30% of munitions were actually instances of SCP-540. However, instances of SCP-540 are indistinguishable from non-anomalous ordnance and were randomly dispersed among the non-anomalous munitions found in the originating depot. 
As such, all munitions recovered have been designated SCP-540 as a precaution. Instances in containment range from hand grenades to a single nuclear device, resembling a modified version of the SAR Bomba with an estimated minimum yield of 75 megatons. Based on current analysis, it is predicted that should this nuclear device possess anomalous properties, its detonation would result in a GK-class hostile greenhouse scenario over a minimum of one-third of habitable land worldwide. Attempts to disassemble low-yield instances of SCP-540 for analysis have resulted in premature detonation and resultant plant growth in approximately 50% of all such attempts. Instances that were successfully disassembled, then reassembled and detonated, did not display any anomalous properties. Testing Log Excerpts Ordnance Tested RGO Hand Grenade Resulting Plant Life 3.1 meters squared of dandelions in full bloom. Ordnance Tested PFM-1 Landmine Buried Resultant Plant Life 12.8 meters squared of sawtooth sedge, averaging 2.2 meters in height. Ordnance tested. 9K115-2 Metis M anti-tank missile. Resulting plant life. Single black oak tree. Height: 17 meters. Diameter: 0.96 meters. Ordnance tested. OTR-23 Oka 9M714K tactical ballistic missile. Detonated without launch. Resulting plant life. Forest of Douglas fir, covering 19.3 HA. 193,000 meters squared. Item number. SCP-572. Object class. Euclid. Special containment procedures. SCP-572 may be safely kept in a locked safe deposit box at Site-19's high-value item storage facility. Standard positive action defenses, explosive, chemical, biological, and mimetic are to be in place at all times, according to standard operating procedure. As there is no possible reason for SCP-572 to be used in the field, the item is to be kept more as a curiosity than for any scientific purpose. Description SCP-572 is a sword manufactured by The weapon is badly balanced for combat use, is made of substandard steel, and does not hold an effective combat edge. However, the weapon has the unusual psychotropic quality of convincing anyone who holds it of its balance and cutting power as well as conferring feelings of great strength and invincibility. This effect cannot be countered by any known means, and the affected subject will continue to maintain these beliefs so long as they hold the blade. Subjects will be compelled to perform dangerous stunts using SCP-572, including but not limited to attempting to cut a moving car in half, slicing through a bullet fired from a rifle, cutting through another sword, and engaging in a live steel duel with a trained period swordsman. Because of the prevalence of unnecessary cutting edges, 75% of such attempts end with serious injury being inflicted upon the user. Should the sword be successfully wrested away from an affected subject, preferably using long-handled tongs to prevent the retriever from being affected, all psychological effects can usually be expunged by a single swift blow to the back of the subject's head. Addendum SCP-572 was retrieved from the home of a Upon being apprehended for violent, drunken, and disorderly behavior, Mr. attempted to charge the arresting officers while brandishing SCP-572, screaming that he would, quote, take their heads, and with it, their power, end quote. As Mr. was overweight and badly out of shape, Officers successfully pacified him using tasers and flexible baton beanbag rounds, fired from a 12-gauge shotgun. Upon retrieving the weapon, Officer was heard muttering about the effectiveness of SCP-572, claiming that if Mr. had managed to score a hit, one of the officers would have lost a limb. This despite the fact that the weapon had an edge blunter than a butter knife. An SCP deep cover operative assigned to the precinct 
discovered SCP-572's unusual properties and retrieved it from evidence storage. An identical weapon from the original manufacturer was procured as a replacement. As of the writing of this article, no further weapons from the same manufacturer have shown any anomalous properties. Item Number SCP-577 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-577 is to be contained within a standard large containment unit, reinforced with steel ballistic shielding. All doors to the containment unit and related areas must be capable of remote operation. Twice a year, D-Class personnel are to be sent into the chamber to inspect the ballistic shielding for any damage caused by SCP-577 and make any needed repairs. They are also responsible for removing any cadavers or detritus left from prior entries into the containment chamber. Any Foundation personnel entering SCP-577's containment must wear full-body ballistic protection. Description SCP-577 is an animated, levitating mass of ammunition of various calibers that persistently spins in a spherical formation. Approximately 40% of the ammunition is 9mm. However, large quantities of 10mm and .45 ACP rounds have also been noted. Bullets within SCP-577 are capable of leaving the mass and firing at speeds comparable to those from a standard handgun. Occasionally, the mass has been observed forming recognizable shapes and likenesses, commonly those of domestic animals. SCP-577's total mass rises consistently, with approximately 1,000 new pieces of ammunition appearing in the mass each year. SCP-577 is exceptionally aggressive towards all Foundation staff and D-Class who have a background in law enforcement. A large amount of its mass will fire towards these staff members, resulting in physical injury and occasionally death. However, research has found that SCP-577 acts friendly towards a small number of D-Class, typically those taken from U.S. prison and homeless populations. Addendum 577-A on 01, 2019, D-28126 was sent into SCP-577's containment chamber for its semi-annual inspection. The inspection and resulting interview have been recorded below. 0 minutes 0 seconds, D-28126 enters the containment chamber. SCP-577 approaches D-28126 and assumes the shape and size of a large cat. D-28126 looks confused. 2 minutes 34 seconds. D-28126 begins the inspection and maintenance, but stops periodically to pet SCP-577. 4 minutes 1 second. D-28126's progress in washing the walls slows, and he appears to be crying. 5 minutes 53 seconds. D-28126 stops working and slumps against the wall. SCP-577 sits next to him and rests its head on his leg. D-28126 continues crying and holds SCP-577 closely. 8 minutes 19 seconds. Staff order D-28126 to leave the containment chamber. He does not immediately comply and instead continues holding SCP-577. 9 hours 37 minutes. SCP-577 appears to guide D-28126's hand into itself. When he pulls his hand out, it is covered in what appears to be blood. 10 minutes 44 seconds. D-28126 stares at his hand for several moments before opening it to reveal a bullet that throbs slightly and drips blood. He holds his hand to his chest and whispers something. 15 minutes 52 seconds. After further exhortation from on-duty personnel, D-28126 stands up and embraces SCP-577 before exiting the containment chamber. Upon being brought out of the containment chamber, the bullets stopped moving and all other anomalous effects ceased. 
This allowed security personnel to detain D-2812-6 and confiscate the bullet for analysis and testing. The blood was genetically similar to D-2812-6's, but not identical. Ballistics analysis of the bullet indicates it had impacted flesh or some other soft substance. However, D-2812-6 was not harmed in any way. The bullet was returned to the D-Class prior to the interview. Dr. Vanderbilt, first things first, please state your name for the record. D-2812-6, I'm Arturo Rosas, uh, D-Class 28126. Dr. Vanderbilt, wonderful. He notes something on his pad. All right, Arturo, I want you to walk me through what happened in there. D-2812-6, it turned itself into my cat, a cat, that me and my brother helped as a kid. I'd recognize his tail anywhere. Dr. Vanderbilt, you're positive it was your cat. D-2812-6, yes. Dr. Vanderbilt, you obviously must really miss it for you to decide to just quit what you were doing. D-2812-6, it's what he said to me. I heard him talk to me. It was quiet. I almost didn't hear it, but he said, I'm sorry. Dr. Vanderbilt, if this was really your cat, what would it have to be sorry about? D-2812-6, it was him. I'm not making this shit up. Dr. Vanderbilt, raises a hand. No need to get angry. I concede this was your cat. Please, go on. D-2812-6. Before I was with you guys, just after my mom kicked me and my brother out, a cat found us. He was a stray, but we gave it a little bit of our food and he stuck around. My brother named him Duck because he liked the sign when we were learning sign language together. D-2812-6. He pauses. He helped us survive. Kind of trained him to be like a therapy cat, you know. My brother was deaf, and it's hard enough not having a home. Duck helped him a lot, until D-2812-6 sighs and wipes his eyes. The last time I saw Duck was, was when he came to find me. I don't know how, but he was always Ricardo's cat first. He led me back to where we were staying, cops all over the area. D-2812-6, I never got to say goodbye. I was so angry and scared. Duck tried to comfort me, but I threw rocks at him. I didn't mean to. It's just a part of me hated Duck for showing me. He hissed at me and ran away. D-2812-6 coughs. Saw on the news a few days later that an unnamed male had threatened a police officer. The cop was naturally afraid for his life and just shot. We were just two kids trying to survive. Of course, the news doesn't bother to ask questions instantly started to list stats about gang violence. Dr. Vanderbilt, that sounds rough, but I'm not really sure how it's relevant. D-2812-6, because that thing gave me a chance to say goodbye. You've probably forgotten what your family feels like, but this bullet was my brother's heart. I lived beside him for years. I know what his heartbeat feels like from the nights we spent trying to keep warm or the times he was afraid when a cop drove past, or when it jumped if I woke him. And for those few seconds where this bullet was still beating, I was able to say goodbye. I felt his blood drain onto my hands, and I was able to comfort him. Dr. Vanderbilt. Well, I hope you're doing better now. D-2812-6. I don't know if it was all in my head, but knowing all the weird stuff here, I feel, I know, that Ricardo could sense I was there. Even now, ten years later. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.